Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, a passionate plea and stand for freedom from Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, strong response from President Biden in his first State of the Union address, and the shadow of racism cast over events and coverage of Ukraine. Our panel weighs in. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. This week, following an unforgettable appeal by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, the European Parliament adopted a resolution to work towards granting Ukraine the status of EU candidate country. Many say it was not only the words of Zelensky's speech that brought about this move, but the tone of those words and the emotion of the translator. Zelensky spoke not long after he reported two missiles struck Kharkiv, a city in Ukraine filled with universities and students and known as Freedom Square. This is called the Freedom Square. Can you imagine this morning two cruise missiles hit this Freedom Square? Dozens of killed ones. This is the price of freedom. We are fighting just for our land and for our freedom, despite the fact that all large cities of our country are now blocked. Nobody is going to enter and intervene with our freedom and country. And believe you me, every square up to today, no matter what it's called, is going to be called as today, Freedom Square, in every city of our country. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. I'd like to welcome this week's panel, journalist Mary C. Curtis of the Equal Time podcast, political analyst Steve Rao, and Dr. Wilmer Leon of Inside the Issues with Dr. Wilmer Leon on Sirius XM. Opening up with you, Mary, I'm sure you heard that speech. What are your thoughts on his speech and its impact on Biden's subsequent speech? Well, of course, I think that, uh, you know, he was a performer and then he became the head of Ukraine. Uh, and he is, uh, you know, I think exceeding everyone's expectations. He said, this is the price of freedom. And it was very emotional. Uh, and when they asked if, if he wanted to leave the country, he said, you know, I want ammunition, not arrive. And he has really rallied the world around his cause. And I do think it had a, an impact on President Joe Biden, both because, of course, he was going to talk a lot about many domestic issues in his State of the Union. But this was right, front and center. And also, it's his strong point, foreign policy. You saw a little bit of unity, the uh, ambassador from Ukraine getting an ovation, uh, but although there is going to be, uh, I think, afterwards, some division because we know how our politics uh, are, uh, play out in this country. Mm -hmm. But I do mm -hmm. think Zelensky has rallied folks and Putin is getting more than he bargained for. Uh, I think we have to really talk about that as well. You know, he was the former head of the KGB. He saw himself going in with power and taking over. And that's not the way it's played out. We've had Biden uh, under his leadership, of course, NATO has rallied and there's a lot of European support. And I do not think that Putin saw that as well. Thank you, Mary. Steve, let me pull you in here because um, here's Ukraine appealing for uh, membership in the EU. But then there's been talk about them uh, wanting membership in NATO as well. What's the difference? What can you share with us about that? <clears throat> Well, you know, the difference, NATO, first of all, is a military uh, organization, uh, 26 countries that was started uh, after World War II to counter Soviet aggression. And uh, it includes both European and North Atlantic countries and, you know, Western countries, obviously, like the United States of America. And its primary mission is when a European member or a member of NATO is attacked, that they could be a military kind of intervention to stop that. We saw NATO, for example, support uh, the Afghanistan under Obama administration uh, going in to take out Al Qaeda, and uh, there was a stall in the UN Security Council. So that's why you have NATO. The European Union is 28 European countries. Uh, it's a political and economic and social organization, and you have to have membership. 
But the reason Zelensky wants to be in Europe Union is first economic. You obviously, you know, the euro. You'd have to, you'd be, you'd have trade agreements. But there's a treaty that would be signed that would enable the uh, European countries to defend Ukraine. Right now, Ukraine is a neutral country. They're not a member of NATO, and they're not a member of the European Union. But if he was a member of the EU, then France and Germany and other European countries could come to the defense of Ukraine. Right now, Ukraine is defending Ukraine airspace. They're, they're, they're doing so much, but they're doing it alone. And, uh, and I'll end with this. I mean, I just want to pick up on what Mary Curtis said. Where I draw inspiration and I get very emotional is to look at how hard these Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom and democracy. That it's something not only they're willing to fight for, but they're willing to die for. And I think it's an opportunity for us in America to look at that in our democracy. Obviously, the president did that at the State of the Union. Now, I think, resorting back to his international experience as the vice president, as the foreign relations chair when he was in the Senate, to rally the nation, to rally the world behind this. But to answer your question, he's picking EU because he wants to be uh, not in this war alone. He needs the alliance of European members who will defend and fight for Ukraine. Dr. Leon, you know, we're all uh, moved by the speech and by the images, uh, but, you know, take us back a little bit. You know, why, do, what does Putin want? And, and why is uh, Ukraine, you know, certainly right now they need some help. So, of course, they want the, the NATO, they want EU. But it, I think it goes um, back more than that, basically on what Putin wants out of all of this. Well, based upon the speeches that I've heard from Russian President Putin and the other uh, interviews that he's done and things that he said, what he wants is very simple. He wants security. He wants the United States to live up to the agreement that the United States made back in 1991 when the Soviet Union agreed to, for the reunification of Germany, East and West. And uh, the United States promised Russia, promised the Soviet Union, that NATO would not expand any further eastward than Germany. And now when you look at a map of Europe, uh, Russia is surrounded by Lithuania, Estonia, uh, um, Latvia, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, these are all NATO countries with U.S. troops, NATO forces, uh, NATO uh, missiles. And Vladimir Putin has been saying very clearly for, shoot, 12, 13 years, we're only going to let you go so far. And the United States is using Ukraine as a proxy. And he drew the line in the sand, and we are where we are. Uh, uh, is Zelensky the U.S. Is using a, is Ukraine? a desperate guy. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, he, he, he's a desperate guy. He, he just, you know, he's following the U.S. directive. Go back to March or May when the United States encouraged Zelensky to send troops to the border. And Joe Biden wound up having to call Zelensky and have those troops withdrawn. Zelensky is following the U.S. narrative the same way the Kurds did when they were encouraged to fight Saddam Hussein, and we know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the strategy of Putin in surrounding Ukraine. Some would say, in particular, um, folks in our own uh, country uh, and Republicans, that this, this, this move was uh, smart, that it was savvy, and in some ways it's a replay. It's typical uh, what he would do. Um, is he, he looks like he's probably going to get what he wants. He surrounded Ukraine. He's going in, and despite the fact that there's a lot of morale and support behind uh, the folks who are fighting, Russia has a stronger army. What do they? What do, what do they get? What do they lose by going in? Well, of course, he's the Russian military is strong. They've taken over Kherson, the city in Ukraine, uh, and he's rattling that nuclear saber. But he's also become a pariah on the world stage, whether it's through financial markets, uh, sporting, all of those things. We have countries like Germany that had stayed out of military involvement since World War II, offering military aid. And of course, he wanted to weaken NATO, which is stronger. And we've seen that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, going forward, that's uh, something that he has lost. And also, we've seen the Russian people are protesting. 
Well, we know that this week President Biden gave his very first State of the Union address, and in it, he outlined, among many other things, current and additional steps that America will take to support Ukraine. Together, along with our allies, we are right now enforcing powerful economic sanctions. We're cutting off Russia's largest banks in the international financial system, preventing Russia's central bank from defending the Russian ruble, ruble, making Putin's $630 billion war fund worthless. We're choking Russia's access. We're choking Russia's access to technology that will sap its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Tonight, I say to the Russian oligarchs and the corrupt leaders who built billions of dollars off this violent regime, no more. Dr. Leon, what will these sanctions do and what will they not do? What they, what they won't do to Russia is really have a long-term dramatic impact on their economy. What they will do to Europe is make their gas prices higher, make it more expensive for them to get grain because Russia is the largest uh, exporter of grain in the world. I think they're the number two uh, largest supplier, number three supplier of, of natural gas and oil. Uh, a, a couple of things, if I could just quickly uh, get to. Uh, if you look, if you listen to what Putin has said, he wants to do primarily two things. He wants to denazify or denazify uh, Ukraine, and he wants to demilitarize the Ukraine. The United States narrative keeps talking about democracy, democracy, democracy. But the one thing that never gets answered is why did the United States go into the Ukraine in 2014 and overthrow their democratically elected government and install a pro-America government when that was not the government that was elected by the Ukrainian people? The other thing that, that, that Putin is doing is protecting what are known as ethnic Russians in the Donbass region, Luhansk and Donetsk, as they are being attacked and shelled by the Nazi U Ukrainian forces from the West. Again, this isn't being discussed. In fact, four days before uh, the uh, 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 Russia went in uh, to to Ukraine, the uh, the uh, security and cooperate the organization for Cure security and cooperation in Europe uh, that, uh, saw 5,667 violations of the Minsk Accords as the Nazi Nazis from the West were bombing the people in Luhansk and Donetsk. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that is just not getting reported because it it goes against the dominant Western narrative. Well, let's talk about those sanctions though. And right now, and thank you for that for that um, analysis. <clears throat> but right now, the U.S. has said we're issuing sanctions, we're coming down on the oligarchs, we're going to try to strangle uh, Russia, and there is likely to be, as you said, Dr. Leon, a long-term impact. But right now, the the people of Ukraine are fighting for their nation. They're fighting, I guess, for their independence. And Steve, I'd like to ask you, you know. What is the outcome, what might be the game-changing event if Putin is successful and, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen right now, but if he is successful in um, taking Ukraine, um, what does that mean? Well, you know, Deb, this is the largest invasion of Western Europe since World War II, and I love the term you use, game-changer, because I think what it does, if he's successful, um, it is going to be the end of what we've known traditionally as the Pax Americana. You know, after World War II, when we founded NATO and we, the Allies were strong to fight for democracy, um, in the 90s, we saw, the early 90s, I was in college at Emory University, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And at that time, we saw many Eastern European countries become democracies. It was quite inspiring. Poland, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, Belarus, many of these countries. And we believed it was a, it was a triumph, that democracy prevailed when President Reagan said, tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev. And we thought democracy would be here forever with free elections around the world. So the first game changer is that if he succeeds, he's basically completely destroying that notion of international order. 
You know, what would stop another country to go in and invade a weaker country, a dictatorship, an authoritarian country? It, it, it's going to send a message to China, you can invade Taiwan. It's going to send a message to North Korea, you can invade South Korea. But there's always rivalries between India and Pakistan. So it makes it very dangerous. So that's the first game changer. The second thing I would say is that um, this is all about when you take away the energy and the gas and the economic sanctions, it's about imperial Russia. Vladimir Putin wants to bring back imperial Russia. He, did, he tried this with Crimea. Uh, he's, you know, he's issuing cyber attacks on our country. He's interfering in elections. So this will be the first step. Now, if he, if he succeeds in Ukraine, then he's going to go after other democracies okay. in Ukraine, in Russia. Thanks, Steve. Mary, uh, you know, do you think that the, the sanctions and the timing of the sanctions and the announcement are, you know, are effective or most effective? It might be like, like 2020. Hindsight is 2020 at this point. But in your opinion, uh, the timing of issuing these sanctions based on the fact that um, Russian troops were surrounding, you know, and building up for weeks, but then later here come sanctions. What are your thoughts about the timing of this? Well, uh, as your previous guests have, have announced, it's different, it will have different effects on countries around the world because so many are dependent on uh, Russia for energy and other things. And so how much hurt will the world feel? Um, from the sanctions that are meant to punish Russia. Uh, so that will have to play out. Um, and it will be interesting to see also how this will all play out with domestic politics here in the United States of America. Because uh, obviously Putin was on the side for Donald Trump to win because he was wanted to weaken NATO. And he actually was very aligned and, and is still calling Putin uh, that, that it was a genius move. Um, and we'll see right now this country is united, but we already have seen Republicans and Democrats splitting on the cause of this and who's to blame. Uh, and we saw in the previous administration that he tried to punish Ukraine and not give them military aid. Uh, and so what's going to happen in 2022 and the 2024 elections will have a lot to do, uh, a lot of effect on our posture toward these other countries. Um, we've even seen at, at a lot of conservative uh, meetings this past weekend, the America First Political Action Committee, they were cheering for Putin. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is just the beginning of how, whether it's sanctions or politics, what effect it will have. Well, the unifying effect of all of this is is now in question, as, as you just pretty much outlined. Um, and, you know, there's talk about freedom and democracy, but even in global affairs, there's the specter of suspected racism. Emerging this week was news about African and Indian students being held back while Ukrainians were allowed to leave at the border. And in addition, in the Twitterverse, users called out a CBS reporter for his biased language in his reporting. So l let me just start with you, Steve. Do you think that these are examples of racial discrimination or bias? Yeah, I mean, I think there is. We've talked about it in the show. There's always racial bias, you know, just making assumptions that, you know, because it's a, more of a, a European country. Uh, uh, when I read those tweets, a white European country, um, you know, there are people of color in Ukraine. But, uh, you know, just this notion that, well, you know, they're being invaded and that's a really, really bad thing. Whereas if you were a you know, a country that's uh, a country of color, you know, more it's it's going to be OK for you to have strife and warfare and things like that. So I could read into it. I don't know whether it was intended as racist, but I do think that when you read these stories and you read these statements, you can really read between the lines and sort of imply that it's a racial bias. So, uh, you know, that's my opinion on it. And I hope that we can use this as an opportunity to to fight for all Ukrainians, regardless of their color of their skin, that they can be free. Well, well, the video and the stories are just just remarkable. I mean, you, I think you can look at it two ways, um, I, but I won't take up the time. I'd love to get your feedback on it, Dr. Leon. I, I think Steve is right. Uh, again, I keep going back to uh, you've got a lot of Nazis in very powerful positions in the Ukrainian government. And we know that they're racist. And so it doesn't surprise me that you would see uh, the preference being given 
to, to white Ukrainians. Uh, I have to uh, push back on a couple of things. One, there's a, a, a dominant narrative that the world is united. Uh, that's just not true. Israel, for example, has not backed uh, the resolution in the UN condemning Russia. There's not one Muslim country that has backed the UN resolution. You've got Poland, Bulgaria, and Slovakia that are not sending, the, and these are EU countries, that are not sending fighter planes, uh, MiG fighter planes to Ukraine. So there is, it's not as dominant of a, uh, of, of a, of a wave of support as the United States is, is making it out, out to be. Um, and in terms of Putin giving the message that it's okay to invade, you, invade countries, I think the United States sent that message when it in, invaded Afghanistan. I think the United States gave that message when it invaded uh, Syria. I think the United States gave that message when they murdered Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. And we, of course, can't forget what we did to Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq. So, I, and by the way, Putin isn't trying to take over Ukraine. If he wanted to do that, it would have been done three or four days ago. So what is he trying what to do try if he's not trying to take over Ukraine? He's trying to demilitarize and denazify the country. And, at, and in that the process, he, and in the process is, is uh, invading and destroying civilian uh, locations and civilians are dying along the way, being killed along the way. And the accusation that... Uh, the Ukraine is run by Nazis is that's debatable and it's also un hard no, to I understand. No, I didn't say it was run by. It, I didn't say it was I, run by Nazis. I didn't say it was run by Nazis. What I said is there is a very strong uh, Nazi contingent called the Azov Brigade in Ukraine that the United States through the CIA has been funding, training, and used in 2014 to overthrow the democratically. Uh, elected government let me, of Viktor Yankovic. Uh, 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 let me pull uh, Mary in here. I just, I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of get a comment that brought together your last question about how this conflict is playing out when it comes to race and how the media is covering it. Because I do think it's great all the time for media to look at how it frames stories. Uh, and as Dr. Leanne has said, how we frame invasions in other countries and refugees and migrants coming from other countries that are black and brown, and how we're looking at uh, the Ukrainians and those refugees. Uh, and, and you can see it's very clear because people are referring to civilized countries and uncivilized countries, uh, and people are rightly calling out the coverage of it. Yes, it might be natural to relate to certain kind of people if you are a journalist, but you have to look at that framing and critique it. Uh, and one journalist even said, you know, I have to watch what I say. And then he said something that was framed in a, a way that seemed racist. And right. so I think this is a good chance to do that because journalists do cover different invasions, different refugees, different migrants. I've seen so many stories now with children and mothers, and you don't see that kind of coverage in that broad a way when you're talking about people from Middle Eastern countries from African Very countries. Very interesting. And I think I think also what's interesting is just the fact that people are asking questions and doing more research to try to find out. I mean, I certainly uh, have become more interested in, you know, what's what's going on there right now, but, but what led to this? And, uh, you know, Steve, I, I want to give you the last maybe one minute here because um, this could be a, a very game-changing episode uh, going forward, and hopefully, you know, the sanctions uh, work, but the, the, the Ukrainian people are asking for a different kind of help right now. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we, you know looking at, uh, you know, we need to help the people of Ukraine. Uh, you know, the European Union membership, I think, would help. Uh, you know, obviously, NATO is not going to happen, but getting other countries to help them, because, you know, they're doing everything they can right now to defend their airspace. Uh, I think Putin will eventually, if not already, go after civilian areas as he as he did in uh, Chechnya and other areas. So I think that that's that's the answer at the end of the day. And I'll end with this. I think this does pose an opportunity for President Biden 
uh, to get back to his foreign affairs experience as the commander in chief, both as vice president, the president of the United States, and as the U.S. senator when he led the Foreign Relations Committee, to really focus outward now. And I do think that's the one thing, I'm an optimist, and I do think that one thing that hasn't gone well for Putin is, you know, he had two objectives, to weaken Ukraine and to strengthen, um, to uh, weaken NATO. Five seconds, Steve. <laughs> but NATO was stronger than it's ever been, as Condoleezza Rice said. Mm -hmm. They're more mob mobilized than they've ever been before. So that, that Putin, Valley Putin has actually unified NATO, the, the likes we haven't seen since World War II. Steve Rao, thank you for your insights. Dr. Wilmer Leon, Mary C. Curtis, we appreciate your commentary, giving us a lot to think about and talk about in today's program. Thanks so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. I want to thank today's guests for joining us today, and we invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thanks for watching. through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.